the Sino from Mauritius, from the breeders of Mauritius, are recognized as being of very high sanitary status, being free from the major retroviruses that we can find in other um, uh, origin source Sinos. On top of that, the breeders of Mauritius, members of our organization, are recognized as the best in class worldwide. Um, very often we get, we, we get praised for that. And given our outstanding biosecurity and animal welfare um, focus and culture. So last but not least, the mission of CBA is also to educate uh, the stakeholders of our activity and the public in general about the important importance of animal in biomedical research. So I won't be longer than that, and I'll just pass on to Dr. Cindy Buckmaster, who's going to tell more about this. Thank you. Good morning. I cannot sit down and speak to people. Sorry, so if you've adjusted your cameras, you'll have to readjust. Um, <clears throat> okay, so I thought this morning that what I would start with is to just give a, a brief, oh, it's a complicated subject, right? So maybe a brief overview about uh, biomedical research and how it actually works and, and where the animals are involved um, so that we have an opportunity to uh, have questions and answers uh, later on that won't require me to go back through all the background every time we have a question. And, and also uh, to give you an opportunity to really think uh, clearly about this before you pose questions later on so that this really turns into um, uh, an opportunity for you to learn some information that then you can share given your respective roles in journalism with the public who needs to know this information and wants to know this information uh, very much. So the, what we're talking about here is you know, medical breakthroughs. We all hear about medical breakthroughs. It's a miracle, it's a miracle. Um, and we know that they happen, right? We know that uh, we can, anywhere we look now, we see people who used to die from cancer who are living with cancer, right? We see people who used to die from diabetes who are living with diabetes. We see people who are living with HIV AIDS who used to die from HIV AIDS. We see people with Parkinson's disease who are uh, getting deep brain stimulation, which came from work with monkeys, by the way, who, whose tremors stop and they're allowed to live a normal life. We see, we see children who have brain tumors that are able to have them removed and live the rest of their lives. We see children struggling with muscular dystrophy and other muscular uh, diseases who are, are now in the midst of clinical trials in large part entirely, actually, uh, because of work that's been done with research in animals that have taught us the things we need to know in order to help them. Yes. Cindy, sorry, yes. coming yes. from our very French. You want me to speak slower? <laughs> yes. Please. I'm sorry. Yes. Okay. My ears are spring. I'm so sorry. Yes. Okay. I'm going to give this a shot. But please interrupt me again because I want you to understand this. Yes. Okay. All right. Let's get into then how research with animals really works. So the biomedical research process uh, is a continuum, all right? And it starts with, the largest part of it, is not studying disease. And that may seem counterintuitive to you, right? You think that when we're talking about uh, research with animals, it's all about treating disease. But, but the truth is, that's the smallest part of the process. Because you cannot understand disease. You can't recognize disease. And you can't figure out how to reset things to fix disease unless you first know what biological systems look like and how they behave when they're completely healthy. And so the biggest part of the biomedical research process is something called basic research. And that's why it's this very big arrow, rather, right? This is the biggest part. This, this is the part of research that is involved in, in studying health. So for example, if you have a car, um, and your car engine dies, it breaks, it makes a funny sound, it sputters, it stops, you bring your car to the mechanic. And the mechanic opens up the hood and looks inside at the engine and can usually figure out what's wrong by looking and listening. Why is that, anyone? Why? He knows how it's he knows. supposed to function. Because this person has studied an engine knows exactly how it should be put together, he knows how it should function, he knows how it should sound. And only because he knows that can he pinpoint the problem. And then, once he's pinpointed the problem in your engine, that's, that's the point at which he can determine how to fix it, right? Could he have done that if he didn't know about a healthy engine first? Could he? No, it's impossible, right? 
It's impossible. And so, and so this is the part of research that most people are not thinking about at all because we're so focused on cures and disease because, raise your hand, if you have anyone that you love who's been impacted by uh, a disease, right? Keep your hand up if you've lost a life, okay? Keep your hand up if treatments and cures exist that save lives, okay? So just as many hands up for loss as there were for saving, right? Um, none of that happened immediately. We had decades and decades and decades and decades of just studying basic health. And people say, well, you know, why does it take so long? We sent people to the moon. There are all these, uh, these technologies that we can do. You know, the cell phone is this is a computer. I put this whole computer. It used to take up a whole room. I can put it in my pocket, right? And it's, it's hard for people to believe that with all of this knowledge we have, that we're still so far behind in understanding the biological systems of the body. But the truth is that biology is extraordinarily complex, right? And we are just this little tiny fiber in this massive tapestry of life. And it's a bit arrogant for us to think that as a little tiny part of this larger thing that we can understand all things. And we don't. We have clues about many things, and those clues have given us enough information to try and look in that engine and find out some of the things that need to be fixed. Is that clear? Okay, I want to make sure because I do speak quickly. So this is the biggest part, and it's been going on, and it's not about disease, it's about health. Uh, trying to learn and understand all the biological systems. And remember, we're talking about understanding these systems at the gross level, at the cellular level, at the genetic level, and at the molecular level, where all of the, the real stuff is happening. Right? That's where the proteins are interacting. And one thing you should know is that animals are very relevant for this, because every mammal uses the same protein for the same biological function. We also know for certainty without question that the biological conservation of how biological systems work in animals does extend to people or we would not have vaccines, aspirins, cures for cancer, cures for diabetes, cures for uh, treatments for HIV AIDS or any of these other things we enjoy. Raise your hand if you've had an MRI. Very good. That came as a consequence of animal-based research. Raise your hand if you've had the surgery of any kind. In that surgery, did you have anesthesia? Yes. Did you have antibiotics? Yes. Did you have uh, follow-up uh, images to make sure that everything was fine? Yes. This, this, all of this, all of it, all of it is a consequence of learning about systems and then turning those, uh, that knowledge of health into an understanding of disease that can be evaluated. So every single thing, you, every day you're using something related to animal-based research. Okay. So this has been going on forever. Um, we're still learning a lot. There's still more than we know to learn. This is the part then that you think most of. This has to do with curing disease. So what happens is you have thousands and thousands of people, researchers, all over the world studying healthy systems. Why? Just because they're interested in how the body works. And they're not studying the whole body. You know, so I studied the parts of the brain involved in learning and memory. This is what interested me. There are other people who study the immune system and how it works. So there's many, many things to study, and people spend their whole life studying this tiny thing to death, <laughs> pretty much, right? Um, and so this has been going on, and so you have people all over the world doing this. They publish papers. All of these papers get out there. And then you have the companies, the ones that want to develop the drugs, waiting. And they're looking at all these papers, and they're trying to see how many clues they have about a particular disorder and how what might be at the base, uh, the basis for this disease, uh, depending on how the system functions when it's healthy. And they grab up those clues, and from that point, they, they try to create a treatment, right? And so that's called applied research, and this is where drug development occurs. Um, to give you a better idea here, right? So let's say that in the course of studying health, we learn that um, uh, there's a gene in a healthy person that's uh, not functioning properly. And because of that, this person has a terrible disease, a terrible muscular disease, and it's a fatal muscular disease. We've learned that because we know about the healthy gene from basic research. The folks in the companies, pharmaceutical companies, contract research organizations, uh, they've looked at this, and, and they have identified now, okay, well that gene is no good, so maybe we, the companies, can develop uh, a gene therapy to repair that gene in these people and make them healthy again. <laughs> See, so it's, it's sort of a partnership. 
but this is the smaller part. So these people take all of those clues and they start developing drug treatments. These drug treatments here can take 10 to 15 years or more to develop. This goes on for decades and decades and decades. <coughs> this is centuries of information, and this just keeps going on. And because we know so little, it will have to keep going on. And so, will animals be necessary for this? Yes. Until I can come to one of you and say, I would like to study the brain. Can I have yours? Can I? Yes? Can I have it right now? No. OK, well, there you go. <laughs> Until I can do that, then I will be in a situation where I will have to rely on studying other animal species um, with information that will transfer to the human condition. OK, so here we are in drug development. Let's pretend that we, the company is very clever. It has created its molecule that they think will fit into the, you know, sort of the missing piece, put it back into the, uh, the, the person who has a disease and make it work again. The first thing we have to do when we have this molecule, if we're a drug company, is we have to test to make sure it's safe. I can't give this drug to hundreds and thousands of people um, and have it be toxic and then they all die. That will be the end of uh, a lot of things, right? So the first thing to determine is whether or not this molecule that I've created that I think will fix the problem is safe. So there are animals involved here, and that's called preclinical testing. And now we're talking about, see, this is, drug, this, is, this is animal testing. See? This is basic research. They're not the same. One is about studying health. One is about studying and repairing disease. And this is the bigger part. So this is animal testing. I'm testing these molecules. I give animals these molecules that I've created. If it's safe for them, then they're done. The rest of it is uh, evaluating uh, whether or not this drug is safe and whether or not it's effective in human beings. So the largest part of the uh, testing part, if you will, is with people. So this little purple part's the animals. Once the drug is safe, the animals are out of the equation. Sometimes we adopt them out to new homes. Sometimes we have to study their tissues. Um, this is something that's very important to remember. The answers are in the tissues. And that means, and this is very sad for us, that very often we have to euthanize animals humanely so that we can look at the tissues and determine what happened in the liver, what happened in the kidney. When you take a medication and that whole list of side effects that they give you it could cause this and it could cause that, and that information comes from studying the tissues in these, uh, in these heroes who have lost their lives for us. Um, so that you know whether or not um, this drug will be safe for you. But the rest of it now is in people. Their role is done. So this is the process of research. Just a quick comment on how it's generally funded. Basic research, since this is something that goes on and on and on and on, um, mm -hmm. is something that's generally funded by uh, academic institutions and government agencies. As you can imagine, a pharmaceutical company would never have enough money to fund hundreds of years of research that wasn't going to end up in a drug necessarily, right? This is just about learning. All of this informs this. Now the companies will invest their own time in really uh, focusing on drug development to address that particular issue. So this is generally funded by private organizations, pharmaceutical organizations, hospitals, clinics, contract research organizations. Are there any questions about this? Okay, great. So I have a quick little video to kind of show you uh, a really great example of how the whole thing fits together um, and toward a very, very exciting advance um, that is absolutely a medical breakthrough. Let's see. Come on.
Okay, so briefly what happened here. This, by the way, was a three minute clip. All of this information was collected over decades and decades by millions of people, right? And so ultimately what happened is people who were interested in the basic science, the basic understanding of how the immune system worked, figured out that um, when invaders, things that shouldn't be in your body come in, that there are certain cells of your immune system that attack them. And um, they attack and attack and attack, but at some point, they have to stop attacking or they go after your healthy cells. So these researchers found out that there were these little molecular uh, checkpoints that were called checkpoint inhibitors that stop that from happening, right? So this is just understanding the immune system. Then later on, people who were looking at cancer saw that, well, cancer does a sneaky thing, and when the checkpoint inhibitors kick in and the cells stop working to attack cancer, um, uh, when they, when they, not when they turn off, when they're on to attack cancer, the cancer undoes it. And so then they keep, they keep spreading and spreading and spreading. And so, um, so what we have is a good combination here of what we learned from basic science and that what we learned in uh, drug development so that we could create uh, a checkpoint, an inhibitor to prevent this from happening, right? And so, but it was all based on the basic science. And this, this is new. This, this latest finding, and you'll see also, there's another really important thing here. Because it's an immune system mediated response, um, the body remembers. So if the cancer comes back, those cells will engage again and go after the cancer. So this is not chemotherapy, this is not radiation. This is somebody understanding how the body works, figuring out how the body works, and then using it itself to kill cancer. Um, two people were awarded the Nobel Prize for this work this year. This is an American, James P. Allison, and this is a Japanese man. This is Gohan Joe. And really, really importantly, I want you to understand something. This man never thought about cancer. He never cared about cancer. He wasn't interested in studying cancer. Cancer wasn't even a part of his, it wasn't a part of his world. This is a man who was interested in understanding the human body. He was, he was interested in understanding the immune system. How does it work? basic research, and he spent his entire career doing that. And in the course of that career, he learned about these checkpoint inhibitors, these checkpoints that the cells have. So this was just basic research. And he tells you here, he's thrilled now that the information he learned was picked up by other companies and turned into a potential cure for cancer. But he had no idea this would happen. He was just studying the immune system. And he says this beautiful thing here, I said, I, I never dreamed my research would take the direction it has. It's a great emotional privilege to meet cancer patients who've been successfully treated with immune checkpoint blockade. They are living proof of the power of basic science, of following our urge to learn and to understand how things work, right? That little fiber in that large tapestry, learning more and more about the tapestry that surrounds us. This is the basis for all cures and treatments. This is what informs what the drug companies do. And can you do that without animals? <coughs> Not right now. So animals are really critical for this. So this was huge, and as you saw, because it uses, it relies on the immune system itself, what you saw was that um, we can apply this strategy to many kinds of cancers. Because your body will identify every invader as a specific thing and remember that invader. And do the same thing to every kind of cancer. It's extraordinary. And it's the first time, uh, I think, in our lifetimes that we, we've even seen something like this, right? Now I would call that a medical breakthrough. Despite all of that, all of this miracle, and all of this work, and all these beautiful animals who have lost everything for us, these heroes, despite all of that, we have people who continue to tell the public, including the journalists, mistruths. <laughs> people who say animal rights activists, this is a, a poster from a very famous one in America right now called White Coat Ways. You can look them up when you like, but PETA, the BUAB, CFI, they're all the same. Um, what they tell the public is this, and they tell you the same thing. Animals, so they say, research with animals must end now. Um, and uh, if we did that, then the basic research stops. And so does the, uh, the applied research, the drug development stops. I mean, we have enough information to go on for a while, but we'll stop learning about how systems work. And once we, learn, once we stop learning how they work, we aren't able to figure out how to fix them. And that's, uh, that's the battle we're in right now. And then somebody will say, well, you don't have to use animals for basic research. You can use computers, right? So think about this for a minute. This, I want you to think about this. 
if you want me to use a computer in place of an animal to learn about biology, I first have to program the computer to behave in every way and on every level like a complete biological system. But I don't even know all that information, right? I don't have the program to put into the computer, right? So what you're suggesting then is that I program something to behave like something I don't understand in order to understand more about what I don't understand. And this makes no sense. And, and people aren't trying to be silly when they say that. It really is just that they don't understand how science works. They don't understand the relevance of the basic research in all of this puzzle. And so that's why they say these things. And then you have groups like this who have their own agenda. They believe that they, you know, they don't want animals involved in this. Many of these people also don't believe in eating animals. And that's fine. They can have their beliefs. The problem is they should not impose it on every other person in the world. I might decide, OK, whatever we know now as far as science goes, I'm good with that. But I can't decide for you and your children and your grandchildren and your parents. I can't make that decision for everyone else. And neither can they. All right, so animals mistreated. We're going to talk about why that's a lie in a minute. They say that there are not, all, not, not animal alternatives right now that can fully replace animals. This is not true. I will show you where we are in developing alternatives. And this is the direction we should go in. The day we don't have to have animals in research it will be the happiest day of my life. I hate hate the fact that they are still necessary, but I function in the realm of reality and know that they are. The day they're not will be the happiest day of my life. But we're not there yet, okay? And then they tell everybody that research with animals doesn't help people. Well, I mean, we're curing cancer, right? AIDS, everything we've talked about, this is just rubbish. Rubbish, more rubbish. Not to say that there aren't some bad people out there. There are bad people in every walk of life, but what happens is, you know, if there's, if there's a, if I read a newspaper article about a murderer in Mauritius, is it fair to me to say that everybody in this room is a murderer? Would that be okay with you? No, right, this is my point. All right. So let's, uh, let's look at the first part, because I do want you to feel better about an, how animals are treated in research. The first thing you should know is that they, they don't live with the researchers. They live in specially designed facilities that, maxim, that are maximized for their physical, social, uh, and uh, veterinary health. Um, they're called Viberia. They are cared for by an entirely different profession of people who are members of the laboratory animal science profession. This is the profession I'm in. I'm the director of one of the five largest animal research animal care programs in the United States. And so we're a completely different profession. We have specially trained caregivers, specially trained vet techs, specially boarded veterinarians who know more than any kind of veterinarian you've ever met because they have to know about every kind of animal in every kind of situation. Specially trained animal behaviorists, specially trained regulators. The regulations for animals and research are greater than any other animal enterprise, maybe even human enterprise, that I can imagine. Um, and that is not an exaggeration. And this is true, at least in the US and in Europe. I can't speak for other countries like China. Theirs are not as stringent. The bottom line is, if you are going to, to get important information you know, about the basic understanding of health of these animals, then they have to be really healthy, or you get nothing. And the drug companies can't build on nothing, right? So, so good science absolutely depends directly on good animal care. And so I'll give you, here's another, I'm gonna give you another little quick video. This was taken at a contract research organization in the United States, this is not staged. This is their place, these are their people, these are their animals. You get a very good understanding of the roles the various people play here and how the animals are cared for.
instead of aliens, right? So the preclinical part of the uh, drug testing, that may go away, and that's what we're targeting right now. We can take animals out of that part, then we're moving in the right direction, right? And then after that, the hope is that we just move on to all the clinical trials. So the basic research will be there for now, but hopefully we'll have a shot at removing animals from this preclinical part of the equation. Best guesses from the, uh, the experts in the world who are doing this is that that may happen by 2035. So we have a little time yet before that happens, but people are working very hard in this direction. This pleases me greatly. Um, I have a sort of mantra, I believe in stronger science, right? And this is more, and whatever's more predictive is what we should do. In our heart of hearts, we're not advocates for animals and research. We're advocates for the best, strongest science possible. For now, that requires animals. If there are other ways to do it, we're all for it. So stronger, uh, for me, stronger science, faster cures, fewer animals. This is the way we need to go in. And very importantly, for those animals who are absolutely still necessary, it's a matter of how. We have to give them the best quality of life we can. How are they cared for? How do people feel about them? Is the emotion they feel and the bonds they feel for these animals, are they validated? Because they should be. These are beautiful living creatures. They're not things. And this is the philosophy that we in research try to abide by and, and try to um, and culture our, our, our caregivers and, and, and vet techs with. So that's the point. And that's exactly what you will see when you go to uh, the breeders in, in Mauritius. All right, I'm going to leave you with a very personal note, and then we'll open the floor for questions. Um, so I mentioned earlier that uh, in my graduate work, I have a PhD in neurobiology. I studied the brain. And the part of the brain I was involved with is learning and memory. And if you're going to study primate cognition, human cognition, um, you really need to do this in another primate. So monkeys are critical for this. My earlier work involved uh, monkeys from your beautiful island, in fact, monkeys that came from bioculture. Um, these animals were very, very important to me. Um, and they were lovely and beautiful and healthy and wonderful animals and very well familiarized and, uh, and, and fairly easy to work with as a consequence of the work they did. Um, so they were beautiful animals. They meant a lot to me. This coming here to learn about them and, and how they were raised beforehand has been very important to me. Um, at the end of my studies, I had to study their brains directly, which meant that I had to euthanize these animals. That meant so much to me. Um, and I may still, this is over 20 years ago, but I get emotional about it every time. Um, and as a consequence of that and, and how important they were to me, I dedicated my uh, doctoral dissertation to them. And so I'm going to share with you my dedication to those monkeys, and then I will open the floor for questions. And I'll read it for you in case you can't read it. It has taken me six years to complete this project. In this time, I've come to realize that none of my sacrifices can ever equal those imposed on the monkeys who lost everything for this information. It was a privilege to work with these intelligent and sensitive creatures and an honor to know them. Their memory will be etched in my being for the rest of my life. I look forward to a day when science can answer all questions in the absence of animal studies. Meanwhile, I pray that science and the rest of humankind will look upon all animals with compassion, empathy, and gratitude and accept responsibility for the condition of their lives. After all, animals have been and continue to be vital to our very existence, enabling us to shape the world to suit our needs, quite often at their expense. Thank you very much, Lisa. We'll have, um, just to let you people know, Cindy's been here for two weeks, and like she said, she's been visiting facilities where we breed monkeys, but she's also met quite a few people. She had a meeting, a presentation with uh, students and academics at the University of Mauritius two weeks ago. And yesterday was a fabulous session at the Rajiv Gandhi Science Center in the context of International Day for Women and Girls in Science with students of A level. And it was a fantastic and really interactive talk with students of Mauritius, science students. So, any questions, please feel free, whether in English or French, we do our best to translate it in French. That are not relevant? I didn't say they weren't relevant. What I said about alternatives is that they, there aren't any that will fully replace animals yet. Mm -hmm. Trump, Peter, and, uh, well, no, so I should, let me clarify. Let me clarify. What I said, and I want to be clear about this, there is nothing that can fully replace a complete intact living system. 
there are certain computer modeling algorithms that we use currently. There are cell cultures that we use currently. There are organoids, which are also stem cell based um, technologies that we use currently. Everything that we have available to us by law that we can supplement our actual work with animals that is a non-animal alternative, we are required to use and we use them that in the course of our studies. So we have our studying the animal systems and then whenever we can use some of these other things that we continue to develop, um, we use them. In fact, the, the, the information we learn from the basic research with animals allows us to improve upon the, the uh, importance or the relevance of these uh, non-animal alternatives. So the, the work with animals actually informs stronger alternatives as well. And so these things are happening in tandem. So it is not that no alternatives are used. What I'm saying is, there is no such thing that can replace an animal entirely. That's what I mean. Yeah. Yes. Well, I saw in an article published by Peter. By Peter, that, yes. Yes. That um, they published research on these tests. That what? And, uh, they did research on what tests? Um, I'll give you a few examples. Mm -hmm. These alternatives to animal testing include sophisticated tests using human cells. Yes. You mentioned that. Mm -hmm. And tissue also managed by two methods, mm -hmm. advanced computer, you mentioned that. Modeling techniques um, and these non-animal methods usually take less time. Okay, so so Pete is saying that these stem cell-based technologies exist now to fully replace animals and that they take less time. What I ask you to do is to contact PETA and ask them which regulatory agency approved it and when it was released for use by the research community. Just ask that question. See what kind of answer you get. Because it doesn't exist. But uh, it's a lie. They're lying. There is zero question about that. Ask them. Ask them the question. You find out by you find out for yourself. You'll find out for yourself. And this this I think is very unfortunate because then the press goes and says these things because they believe they're very convincing the way they say it. And before we spoke today, you wouldn't have known all of these other things. So you're an easy mark. I mean, the press, you guys are all easy marks for, for activists because you don't understand the depths of the science. This is a fact. I'm from New York and I want you to know the truth, right? This is a fact. And then you go out and you tell the public these things and it's, it's not a minor issue. I mean, it may be really good for circulation because it's dramatic, but it's not a minor issue. If you give false information about biomedical progress to people who will be in the position to vote and support things that aren't true, you're basically saying to them, we don't care about your health, or the health of your children, or the health of your grandchildren, or the health of your pets, because we are passing on this misinformation to you, enforcing your belief in it, and you now have this false sense of security that you can have everything you want without having the animals be a part of the equation. And for now, without the animals, biomedical progress doesn't continue the same way. And so you're, 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 you're harming people by, by passing on information that's not true. And so if you just, just I would put it back in PETA's court, contact PETA and ask them the obvious question. Which, which, exactly which alternative are you speaking of that completely replaces animals in preclinical testing? Which regulatory agency approved it? And send me the paperwork or give me the date that it was approved and tell me what its trade, its trade name is. And you're not gonna get an answer because it doesn't exist. It's very easy for them to tell you all kinds of things because they know that you don't know this. They know that nobody knows this. And I'm not picking on journalists. You just, you just happen to be a room full of journalists. If you were anybody else, I would have the same conversation. Right? You're, you're, look, you are loving, kind-hearted uh, members of the public like everybody else. You love animals? Raise your hand if you love animals. Very good, then I love you. Excellent. Right, <laughs> right. I mean, so when we love animals, that makes, that makes us especially easy marks for this. But the, the truth is none of us want to accept, we don't like the fact that we, and I mean we, everybody in this room, everybody else you know, we demand treatments and cures for ourselves and our loved ones, including our pets. And we don't want to believe that animals are necessary for that because we don't like it, because we love them. So when someone gives us an opportunity to think that it's not true and we don't need them, we jump all over that. That's a great way to live, but it's not true. And guess who gets left behind in all of that? Who gets left behind in that charade? The animals themselves. While everybody's arguing about no animals and yes animals, and it becomes this big argument, this us versus them, the fight at some point becomes more important than the thing you started fighting about. And that's the animals. If you really care about animals, then everybody needs to get together, the animal rights people, the rest of the public, the researchers, and we need to put down on the table all of the truth, everything it takes 
for all of us to get these cures and treatments we demand. The good, the bad, the ugly, the things we like, the things we don't like. Put it all out there so that we can discuss these things in truth and move forward in a, in, a, in a loving way, right, towards solutions that will benefit animals and people that are real. If we could do that, we'd move along faster and develop alternatives faster. But right now, no one's paying attention to any of that because they're too busy arguing. And the animals don't care about who wins this argument. <coughs> So this is the thing that I think upsets me the most about, about this kind of information from PETA. You know, this, it keeps all of us from getting to real solutions because we're too busy arguing about things that aren't true. But what do you think of uh, the vegan? That's okay. Uh, Cruelty-free products? Yeah so, yeah, so I can't speak much on that because this biomedical research is very different from consumer product safety testing. It's not just makeup. It's your conditioner, your toothpaste, the visine you put in your eyes, anything you put on it. What do I think about it? I don't know much about it, but I can, t well, I don't know much about it because I don't study it, but I can tell you this. Anytime it is absolutely true that an animal is not necessary for any of this work, we should not use it. And what I'm hearing is that in other countries, I mean, I can't speak a lot because I don't have that expertise, right? But what I'm hearing is that in other countries, like in Europe, um, they've discontinued this. And uh, if they can discontinue it, and that's really true, I don't see why the US doesn't discontinue it as well. If they're not really necessary, we shouldn't use them. My guess, and this is just a guess based on science and understanding, you know, they're not trying to understand the complexities of, of biology when they're, when they're trying to evaluate whether or not something's gonna irritate your skin, for example. It's a much simpler, uh, more constrained, a specific thing to evaluate. And I think it's simpler then to create synthetic membranes, for example, and other ways to test those things. Now I can give you uh, two uh, websites to look at where uh, they talk a lot about this and they're working on this. And um, one is uh, NC3Rs, and that's uh, in Europe, right? And there's a lot of people working on that. And you'll see that there already are alternatives to animals for things like cosmetic testing. And then the other one is uh, ICCVAM, um, and that's uh, about toxicology. And they're also, they'll list in there the things that they have removed animals and they use alternatives instead. So what I think is that any time we don't need them, we shouldn't use them. If we can ever get to a point where we can do all of the preclinical testing for drugs, and it looks like maybe 2035 will be that point um, without animals, we should do that. Um, and maybe, as we continue to learn more and more from animals, we can develop more and more strategies that will allow us to use some of these stem cell based things, maybe even to ask basic questions, right? We should, we should continue to, to develop strategies for non-animal non alternatives. We should continue to, to, to use the information we learned about biology to inform that. We should continue then to remove animals to the best of our ability uh, throughout this process as we learn more and more. And for those animals who are still absolutely necessary, and only when they're absolutely necessary, we should provide them with the best quality of life possible. Uh, we saw videos on how animals are treated mm -hmm. the conditions mm -hmm. Yes. But what about the experiments and the mm -hmm. So this is a fair, this is, I'm glad you asked Can you repeat the question? Yes, I'm going to, yeah. So the question was that uh, we saw, you know, we, so I told you in the beginning that there is a group, different group of people who care for the animals 24-7, and that's us, the lab animal folks. The question is, well, what about the actual, you know, procedures, right? Um, so this is, and this is an important question. This is what I mean by full transparency. We need to be fully transparent about all of these things, or the public will never have a, an informed opinion about any of them. So, have you ever had a surgery of any kind? Yes? Okay, did you... Um, I felt everything. You did? You didn't get anesthesia? Yeah, but I felt everything. Yeah, well, that wouldn't happen to our animals because they're not allowed to feel anything. Go to the U.S. principles. Um, I can send it to you, but go to guideline four. There's a, uh, a statement in there, and it is uh, the framework for all of the uh, regulations that exist in the U.S. anyway, that says that we are to assume that if something causes pain in a human, unless there is very strong information to say otherwise, that we must assume it also causes pain in an animal, and that we must provide pain, uh, pain medication, or if, if something happens and the animal is suffering uh, so badly that we can't control the pain, that we have to euthanize the animal. So you should not have felt that, because that would not, if that happened to one of our animals, we would have been cited for that. Who else has had a surgery of any kind? Okay, did you have anesthesia? Yeah. Yes, did you have uh, antibiotics before your procedure? Yes. When you were done, did you have painkillers? No. 
Yes, and did you have, uh, you said you were kept comfortable, right? And did you have a follow-up care by a physician? Yes. Did, was that person available to you for 24 hours? No, okay. All of that is what our animals have when, when they have procedures, even mice. Mice have to be anesthetized fully. Um, they have to, we have to use aseptic procedures so that they don't get infections. They're provided with uh, antibiotics when necessary. They're, invited, they're provided with post-operative uh, pain relief. We have all of this documented. We have to document everything. So, so this is how our animals uh, are treated during their studies. This is not at all what you hear from the animal rights people, right? They'll have you believe that we take these animals upstairs in a closet somewhere and we just start ripping off their body parts. And that is completely false. It's, 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 it's false and it's dishonest and it serves their purpose, which is fundraising. Because when they tell you something awful, the next thing they say is, send us money so we can help. I'm not saying that they're not, that they don't all not care about animals, but this sort of dishonesty is again what keeps us from actually talking about the truth and getting animals out of the equation. And it's very wrong. It's dishonest. And again, you can come. If you ever get to the U.S., I will take you through my facility. I've had uh, uh, a national um, children's network come through there and film our animals. Um, uh, Rebecca Sklut here is uh, an author who's writing a book. She's a world famous author. Um, and she's writing a book about this. And I had her come in and she actually uh, watched some of our surgeries, including with monkeys. And she's done this in several institutions all throughout the U.S. You talk about 2035. What's going on afterwards? 2030. Oh well. Oh, this just keeps going on and on, right? All that was that was just to say that that was the soonest this person thought that we could get the regulatory agencies to get on board with it. The irony of this is, in in order for the regulatory agencies to approve of human organs on chips before they move on to clinical trials, they want uh, the uh, the researchers to develop animal organs on chips because they already have all of this data for, that pre-exists for uh, animal research and the studies there. So they want to be able to compare that information to what's on the chip. I think if those things correlate strongly, then they'll say, okay, that's proof of concept. Let's do human or, uh, organs on chips and then take animals out and go straight to human clinical trials. The guess is, and we, we assume this will be true, that the human organs on chips will be more predictive of the human situation after. So this is what everybody's working on and hoping for. And then after that, I mean, the more we learn in the basic, the more we, we learn about how to apply these non-animal alternative methodologies as well. Okay, any more quick questions uh, before we wrap up? Yeah. One more question. Yes. So you were, <coughs> you were showing a video where people were adopting the dogs that were uh -huh. used for treatment. Yes. But then you also said a bit earlier that sometimes you have to analyze the tissues yes. of the animals. Yes. And for that, you have to euthanize them. Yes. So what is the percentage of animals that yes. make it till adoption maybe yes. and then those that right. have to be euthanized. Right. Small. I mean, uh, this, so this is again, truth, transparency, full honesty. The answers are in the tissues. If we're studying, um, we're studying biological uh, phenomena that are at the cellular, genetic, and molecular level, very often it means that we need the tissues to get those answers. The answers are in the tissues and so the truth is that the vast majority of animals in research are euthanized so that we can understand these things. And that's very hard for us, the people who care for them, because we get very strongly bonded with them. This is the job of our folks. Um, they have to be able to recognize them by sight, and does it look in their eye look different, or are they maybe sick? You know, they get very attached to these animals, and we have to work with them emotionally throughout this process, uh, because their hearts are broken day after day. They go home and they grieve over, the, over those animals, and they come back the very next day to show the same love and compassion to the animals who remain, because they also have a lot of love and compassion for the children and grandmothers and mothers and, and, and pets who are still looking for treatments. And so they understand in their mind the balance, but it's very hard on their heart. So when we do have some animals, they don't all have to be euthanized. It depends on the level of the question, you know, it depends on the level of the answer, whether the tissue is necessary. Uh, when it's not necessary, then it is a great day for us to be able to adopt them out to families. And in fact, in the U.S., I have started an organization of my own called Homes for Animal Heroes. You can look at, um, that specifically is about uh, adopting dogs that can be adopted out after research. Okay, uh, yes, yeah, you, can, you can still, uh, while we're having tea, coffee, and the refreshments outside, those of you who want to speak to Cindy on this morning interview, please feel free. 
Uh, we'd also reiterate our invitation to come and visit us. We are very open, we're very transparent about what we do. And uh, throughout the years, many journalists have come and visited our facilities. We expect the same invitation to do this. Welcome.